Yeah, with this, I, I, I thought we, we might try to do a schnitzel. Obviously, in Spain, we don't call it schnitzel. For me, this is a filet empanado. If somebody asks you, what are the top ingredients? Right, so, obviously, the Kobe beef, caviar, bluefin tuna, of course, in the pork side, like Iberian pork, no doubt. You can tell me about this breed, the other breed, Iberian pork is way, way better. If you have access to those ingredients, you're full of not using them. Since I'm gonna pound it, it's gonna, it's gonna be light fry. You don't, you don't have to overcook it. Same with, with all of the Iberian pork. You don't have to cook it until it's so dry, you know? Like a regular pork, if you don't do it properly, it's, it's gonna get dry and that's not nice to eat. With Iberian pork, you don't have this problem. Are you a perfectionist? Yeah, very much so. <laughs> they say that Virgos are very perfectionist. And I think that's right. I'm using all of your batteries for this. <laughs> no, it's okay. So we're gonna pound it to make it flat. It's the Thor hammer. I cut the bag, otherwise it will be more difficult to, to take it out of the bag and you know it's kind of delicate, it can, it can break, I don't want that. That way the, the bone is still attached to the meat. Usually we, we use a pasteurized egg. For the restaurant, in this case we're going to do fresh egg. Flavor is going to be better. So flour, egg and breadcrumbs. In this case we're, we're going to use panko. Ideally you do it twice. This is uh, not a Spanish part where we're going to fry it in clarified butter. The flavor of the butter makes everything better. In other kinds of cuisine, you have many different layers of flavor where if one is not perfect, it's okay. In Spanish cuisine, if one flavor is off, you're going to be able to tell. So basically here, we are playing with two different flavors. That's it, no more. I'm going to serve it with a roasted pepper and a sauce that we made with the actual pepper. So this sauce, we liquefy the pepper and then we cook garlic, a lot of garlic and olive oil and reduce it down to the half. And then we just blend it and emulsify with oil. You're serving pepper with pepper sauce. So if the pepper is not good, forget about it. The best schnitzel probably you can have with Iberian pork, you know. <laughs> we are at Casa Dani, from Chef Dani Garcia. The cuisine we are doing is very Spanish honest, but kind of elevated. Today I'm very excited because we are receiving a special delivery of Iberian pork from Campo Grande. One of the most fun part of our job is to be able to try new ingredients. It's very exciting to try products you haven't tried before or even qualities that you haven't tried before. That kind of conversation creates a, a really cool environment in the kitchen. We brought some cool stuff for you to try here. The four rib racks, secreto, Spanish secret as you know, the pluma, okay. the top of the right. loin. It's like a tenderloin on steroids. We like to call it the Wagyu of pork. It gets this like super reddish color because it's not fed corn from like industrial pigs. It's just such a different eating experience. Where in Spain do you have the farms? All of the farms are in West Spain and Southern Spain, Extremadura, Andalusia. Iberico pork is one of the most amazing lenses into Spanish food and culture. It's an ancient breed that hasn't been kind of industrialized and it's not only you know pork chop sausage and bacon you've got 16 different fresh meat cuts that are all only possible with the farmers and the butchers and the entire production and supply chain one thing that is important for our mission in communicating there's pork and then there's iberico there's just so much to discover trying to find these cuts you need to have the contacts basically you don't go to whole foods next door to get Pluma Iberica. Today we're gonna cook with the Pluma Iberica Campo Grande. Every time I get a chance, I order this plate. What we're trying to do is take most of the fiber and the excess of fat. If the cut has too much fattiness, it kinda overwhelms. Alex has been working with me since pre-opening. He was here for the R&D, creating the menu. Very professional guy, very passionate. He's very eager to learn. And we're gonna add some koji, 
after marinating in the koji, the meat is super tender and full of flavor. So shio koji is used in fermentation, especially in Japan, and we find out that it's really good for tenderized meat. And we're gonna go ahead and sear it. It's complemented with bok choy that we blanch and then we sear in the planche as well. We can do medium rare, but honestly, I, I would rather have it like medium. That's my go-to when it's about Luma Iberica. So we're gonna put this in the oven. See, add medium, it's perfect. So this is how we do it here. The pluma is very powerful, you know, so yes, a small amount of pluma goes a long way. And that's pluma iberica with mojo rojo. Something that my mom used to make a lot for me was lomo adobado. It's my comfort food. I will eat that every day if I could. So something that I would like to try today is that recipe by using secreto. It takes my mom's dish to another level. Uh, the secreto iberico is a part with a lot of uh, infiltrated fat. So we're gonna try to remove this fat. This is what we are gonna use. The secreto is, is I will say, underrated, but this is an amazing cut. All of this infiltrated fat, like take a close look, this is amazing. That speaks for itself. So this is the resemblance of tuna and the Iberian pork. If you put a wayu piece here, it will look not the same, but you know, very, very similar. So basically we're gonna do a marinade similar to chorizo. So we are gonna cut this first. Paprika, uh, pimentón de la vera, a touch of oregano, just a little bit. And then garlic. We use a lot of garlic in Spanish cuisine. So we have to make a, a paste. It's very similar to to the marinade that, to make chorizo. Smoked paprika de la vera is what makes the difference in a, in a Spanish chorizo. This uh, smell is so characteristic for me. It reminds me of the matanza when in some small towns in Spain we have this tradition of killing a pig and process it and do everything, every kind of charcuterie. This smokiness of the, of the paprika, it takes me right there. So we're gonna let it marinate in here for five minutes. A small bite of this is so rich. You don't need to eat a lot to enjoy it. It makes a lot of sense to put a, a quail egg. This is how we do it in Spain. We use olive oil and we cook it in a higher temperature. We want this crunchy part. We call it puntilla. The jolk is gonna act like a sauce, you know, so that's basically the purpose of that. That's the pork. Let it rest for a little bit. Look at this, this, this is beautiful. Which one would your mother like the most? All of them. Yeah. My mom supports me a lot. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. Uh, she's very critic with me. When I, when I cook at home, I'm always like, ooh, is she gonna like it or not? Because sometimes she's like, nah, that's not for me. Like, oh, and, you know, parents. <laughs> mm. You can taste that it's very pork, you know. There is a huge tuna culture in the south of Spain. They've been fishing tuna for centuries. So here in the restaurant, we use a lot of tuna. We have a section in the menu dedicated to bluefin tuna. So in this case, we have farmed tuna uh, as well from Spain, from the Mediterranean. In these fisherman towns, like, they've been eating tuna forever. It's like opening a present, you know. It seems that only raw tuna is possible in Japanese cuisine. Like the Iberian pork of the sea. And now what we are trying to do is showcase that in Spain we have really good tuna, I will say, with Japan, the best in the world. This tuna was alive three days ago, and then they ship it overnight, 
I want to do it myself because with the little, you know, like scraps, I chop it a little bit, salt, olive oil, and I have a snack. The skin is really hard, so look at this. Look at all of the fat infiltrated. I, I think it has a lot of resemblance with the pork. We say that from the pork, we even use the way of the walk, meaning that we use every single part of the pork. With the tuna, it's kind of the same. So what we do is we do like a sashimi style cut uh, that is going to be this wide. You know. It's going to go to the super freezer. It's going to be minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius. And this is the way we, we can keep the tuna frozen for a year. We do something different with the tuna that you're not going to find anywhere else. Actually, it's one of our most popular dishes here, tuna porterhouse. We call it like that because it's the whole uh, section cut of the tuna. This is a carpaccio, right? So the, the best way to make a carpaccio, obviously, is uh, from frozen. Uh, it would be impossible to have a, a straight cut so thin if, if it was fresh. We showcase all of the parts from the toro to toro and akami. We get the, the whole cut and then we cut it in smaller pieces so it's easier to put in the Udeli slicer and then put it back into pieces like if it was a puzzle. You're not going to be able to, to tell the cuts when it's covered with olive oil so it looks, it looks the actual whole cut. It's a very like a dramatic dish since it's so big. We add the, the saltiness, we add the olive oil, our liquid gold, and that's it. We don't do anything else. And that's the porterhouse. Paella is a big focus in this restaurant. Almost every table gets a paella every night here. So we're gonna do a paella with uh, Iberian pork rack. So I only put salt because it doesn't need any other flavor. So first we're gonna sear the pork in the paella pan. That way, caramelized here, so we are gonna use these flavors to then develop the flavor itself of the paella. You don't need that much pork fat because otherwise it will overpower the rest of the flavors. Every day, as you can see, we prep for every kind of paella. We have a different spices that go into it. This is a short grain. It's called dinamita rice. It has a lot of power of absorption. Okay, and that is gonna go to the oven. The first step is the stock. This is what gives the paella the flavor. Chicken stock is very versatile. It's very important, the, the ratio oil and water. One of the characteristics is the socarrat. When the stock evaporates, the oil goes to the bottom and then it kind of fries the bottom part of the rice, which for the people that like paella, they know this is the best part. So now that it's gonna start boiling, I'm gonna add the rice. We do six minutes, high heat, and then we're gonna lower it. The pan well that we are using for the paella is actually called paella. So we are doing 300 grams of rice for 1,800 grams of stock. The ratio is crazy because the pan is very big, so it has a lot of evaporation surface. You cannot make paella in just a regular pan because that wouldn't be paella. It would be something else. Basically, to me, you have to do it in the proper pan, the proper rice. The rice is the most technical thing to cook because it's very easy to make it bad. It's very dry outside, but not so dry here. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna get some from the middle and put it in the edge. And then at the end of the day, if the flavor is good, that's the most important thing. You don't stir constantly because you don't want the starch of the rice to come out. So now, from now, we don't touch it. There are tricks always. We're gonna rest it, it's gonna be ready to slice. If you just follow a recipe by reading all. Oh, We're gonna cover it, five minutes. It doesn't give you enough details, never. So basically, the rice finished cooking with its own steam. And now we're gonna slice the pork. So you have to have it in you. You gain that with experience. When you follow a recipe in a book, you know, you can follow the ingredients, but there's something missing, and this is the touch of the chef. 